So uh, today we're going to listen to a speaker which is very close to our foundation, uh, both in terms of uh, scientific production and uh, human relationship. Uh, it's Norberto Chavez Tapia, Chief of Gastroenterology, Director of the Transplantation Department and Translational Department, uh, President of the Research and Ethical Committee of the Medical Sewer Foundation in, uh, in uh, Mesuda de Mexico. Mexico City. Even more important, I think that Norberto took the position of editor-in-chief of Anasome Pathology since more than uh, three months, four months, and now is getting uh, reshaped the, uh, the journal, which is increasing um, uh, the, um, the info factor and uh, valid the scientific validity. I'm pretty sure that within two and two years, under the uh, wise guidance of uh, uh, Norberto, Anna's pathology will be even more strong in the international, uh, 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 very competing field of uh, uh, hepatology. So today, uh, Norberto agreed to talk about a, a topic which has been seldom addressed and which is going to be very interesting. Uh, the topic of the yellow, the title of the yellow uh, webinar of today is the relationship between NAFL and thyroid. Norberto, you are on. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's very, very nice to see all the, all the new faces from Trieste. I'm very happy to be here. And I will start my presentation. Okay. Are you okay? Is okay the presentation? You can see. Okay, great. Well, I can uh, see very clearly. Go ahead. Perfect. Thank you. Well, we will talk about in the next few minutes about the relationship between NAFLD and thyroid. This is a very active research and therapeutic field. This starts maybe 10 years ago. It's quite strange, this story, because um, the epidemiological association is not so strong. However, despite of this a small association, epidemiological association, there is a, a very active research field in which the regulation of thyroid uh, metabolism uh, through the thyroid receptor, it's a very important target nowadays for the management or treatment of patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So we will start with some perspectives. As you can see here, we have the epidemiology of hyperthyroidism in, in the world and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease as well. And you can see it's quite asymmetric. I mean, the prevalence and the importance of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it's, it's obvious. You, we can observe prevalence near to 10 to more than 30%. However, in the other side, we can observe the prevalence of hypothyroidism in the world. And the first important data is that we have a scarcity of data. And the second one is that the prevalence in the worst it's cases, it's around 4%. So it's quite strange why thyroid diseases and thyroid metabolism could affect non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. However, we can see that uh, basic research and now pharmacological research is a very important field that brings a new tool for the management or theoretically a new tool for the management of patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Sorry. This is a roadmap about how hypothyroidism could affect the liver. This is because we have several receptors and the activity of these receptors change uh, in each organ. Uh, I, in addition, we can observe how the thyroid stimulating hormone per se could affect the liver metabolism in particular for cholesterol and triglycerides. We can observe how high levels of TCH, this is characteristic for patients with uh, subclinical or over hypothyroidism we can observe an increase in the hepatic lipoprotein lipase activity. But as well, it's observed uh, disturbances for the cholesterol metabolism. For that reason, the only the elevation, the serum uh, elevated levels of TCH are important to develop non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. In the other side, there is less important information about the immune balance uh, related with hypothyroidism 
through the antibodies, but in this moment is not so important. And maybe the most important aspect of the relationship between liver and thyroid is the, le the serum levels of thyroid hormones, talking specifically about 34 and T3, but specifically about the thyroid hormone receptor. We can observe that in those cases in which uh, thyroid hormones are lower in the serum, we can observe how impaired lipid metabolism with lower expression of uh, low density lipoproteins in all the body and specifically in the liver. But it's also important to observe how the hormones related with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease are expressed, are expressed uh, with higher levels of leptin, low levels of adiponectin, and increased levels of uh, fibrosis growth factor number 21 that nowadays as well is a very important uh, pathophysiological pathway for the development and treatment of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But we can observe also how there is an increase in inflammatory cytokines, mainly tumor necrosis factor alpha and tumor growth factor and transforming growth factor beta. Oxidative stress is also uh, increased in those scenarios in which uh, low uh, thyroid hormones are present with free radical uh, generation, lipid peroxidation. And this is also a very important aspect, uh, disturbances to hepatocyte damage and regeneration. And finally, and be the corner of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but this is a corner also of patients with low levels of thyroid hormones. We can observe the impaired glucose uptake and increase in free fatty acids and triglycerides, specifically in the liver. With this scenario, it's quite uh, com it, it, it's pretty easy to understand why lipid, no, no, thyroid metabolism could affect the liver, and specifically, it's the main characteristics of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. However, this is very important. It, it, I think it's very independent effects. This is more uh, talking about the thyroid stimulating hormone in which this is only observed these disturbances in patients with uh, the disease, with uh, overt hypothyroidism or with clinical hypothyroidism. In this scenario, we can observe an increase in gluconeogenesis, increasing the levels of fat in the liver, low production of bile, uh, synthesis of bile acids, and increased cholesterol synthesis. This is very interesting for epidemiological and maybe for experimental issues. However, the most important aspect is how the transporter of thyroid hormones could affect many, many, many aspects of the uh, enzymatic machinery in, page, in, in the liver, uh, talking about not only in the cell, in, in organelles in the cells, inside the mitochondria and in in genes. This is important because the receptors in the liver, we talk about this in, in the next slides, in the next slides, is mainly nuclear. And we can observe that in those cases in which uh, thyroid hormones are lower in the serum, we can observe increase the novel lipogenesis, lower fatty acid mobilization, but it's important that affects the fatty acid, fatty acid oxidation and mitophagy. For this reason, it's very important to know that the, the activity of, of thyroid hormones in animal models affects significantly the proteins produced by the cell. This is a very important study in which in, animal, in, in an animal setting, those animals uh, supplemented with uh, thyroid hormones has a differential production of uh, plenty of proteins. This uh, protein proteomic study uh, demonstrates how there is modifications in mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative phosphorylation, acute phase response signaling. This is very important. These aspects, this is how the activation of nuclear receptors are affected by the addition of thyroid hormones and the production of uh, uh, of enzymes that affects the oxidative stress. So 
This is very important because, for example, in, in this case, we can observe how the stimulation of the uh, thyroid uh, stimulating hormone receptor by the, by the TCH could affect or increase the production of SIRT1. This SIRT1 from the nucleus could move to the mitochondria and through the cyclophil in D could increase significantly the production of oxidative stress. So this is only some examples of how oxidative, how the thyroid metabolism could affect a lot of pathways involved in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But I think this is one of the most important papers that brings the tension for the thyroid hormone receptor. In this paper, we can observe the forms and isoforms. Usually we talk about the isoform alpha, this is the, the cause of most of the physiological activity of thyroid hormones. And this is uh, clear about two things. The first one is the localization. You can observe how the alpha receptor for thyroid hormones is in all parts of the, of the cells. And I mean, I'm talking about nucleus, plasma membrane, cytoplasm, and other not well, not, not well known. And the activities or hypothetical activities are very, very heterogeneous. This is because there is a very interesting biofeedback between the thyroid hormones and uh, their activity in central nervous system through the thyroid stimulating hormone. But the most important advance is related with the beta receptor. The beta receptors has four isoforms. These isoforms are quite similar, I mean, the activities are quite similar, and all of them are predominantly nuclear. This is important because uh, the receptor could, uh, can bind as monomer, as homodimer, as heterodimer with retinoid X receptor. So this brings a lot of complexity about the pathways um, to, of, the, of the signaling of the tier of the thyroid hormone receptor. And to be more complex in this experiment, it's observed how the diverse DR motifs are expressed differently according to the environment of thyroid hormones. So the activity of the beta receptor is also very heterogeneous despite that it's only located in the nucleus. And this is very active because with, it depends about the quantity of serum, uh, uh, thyroid hormone serum levels are in the body or in the cell and the activity inside the cell. For that reason, it's very complex how to manage this, this hormone, this receptor, sorry. And this explains why the history about the drugs for manage or to bind to the thyroid beta receptor, it's quite strange. Now it, it is a, an option that is very interesting. But the adverse events observed by this kind of drugs is mainly dependent of this heterogeneous activation of the thyroid hormone receptor. Additionally, it's very interesting and complex how this receptor is metabolized inside the cells. In this the diagram, we can observe the first part, the activity of the activation of the thyroid hormone receptor. But then we have a very complex process that could be um, managed in, 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 even pharmacologically uh, because the desensitization is very important process. Then the receptor is sequestered inside the cell and inside the cell could be to two different pathways. One is to recycling, uh, express again, or degradate the uh, receptor. As you can see, there is a lot of uh, pathways that could affect this process. And this could explain why it's so complex to um, obtain a perfect agonist for this receptor with a very specific effect. Uh, this explains maybe why there is a lot of adverse events or unexpected events observed in trials, in clinical trials with drugs uh, or agonists for TRH. I would like to focus in two important aspects. The first one is that uh, the activity, uh, the uh, 
from MAP kinases, it's different if the receptor is located in membrane, in plasma membrane or in seed cell or in the nuclear part. As you can, yeah, that, that is the case of the beta receptor in, in, in the liver. It's completely different the pathways that are activated uh, in, with ligands in, in TRH. And this is also expected that we need a specific activation of the beta receptor. Otherwise, we can observe a lot, a lot, a lot of unexpected adverse events. And this is why in, in, in the past, some, some research groups proposed to give general T3 and T4 hormones for patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But of course, the adverse events are really, really high and unterrible for that reason. We need a very specific activation on the beta receptor due to the specific path pathways related with, uh, with its activity. The modification of TRIH, of the thyroid hormone receptor, could modify the autophagy. This is a very important study in which it's observed how the autophagy is a very important aspect of the liver metabolism. We can observe how autophagy could affect the Communi the paracrinal communication between brown adipose tissue with white adipose tissue and the increase of free fat acids. And as you, as you know, free fat acids promotes the, the lipid accumulation in the parasite and the copper cells. And this brings the stetosis and the, uh, the inflammatory um, presentation with inflammation, oxidative stress, and apoptosis promoting steatohepatitis. But autophagy could affect all this process, but could affect also how the hepatic stellate cells could move from quiescent to activated form. And this brings fibrosis and cirrhosis. So other, uh, it's very important because thyroid hormones, there is a lot of information, well, not a lot, but enough information about how uh, the thyroid hormones and a specific the beta receptor of thyroid hormones is very important for the regulation of autophagy in the liver. This is information from cells, mice, and humans. And we can observe how in cells, those FG2 cells with the specific receptors and with the agonist increase the mitochondrial lipid oxidation and reduce the inflammatory response through the autophagy. In mice, in a experimental NASH model, it's observed how, how is a decrease in the cholesterol and LLT, hepatic steatosis, inflammation, and fibrosis. This is also regulated through the increase of hepatic mitochondrial content and function, hepatic autophagy, and promote beta oxidation of free fat acids in this animal model. And finally, and the most re and, and recently, there is a decrease a quantity of liver inside the liver in patients treated with an agonist, a very selective agonist for the beta uh, thyroid hormone receptor called resmeterum. And all this information brings uh, a good opportunity to analyze not only as target or pharmacological target, but also as experimental uh, models. Okay. Um, this is a, another important evidence, experimental evidence about how thyroid hormones affect inflammation. This is experiments with infection, chronic inflammation, a model for cancer, and we can observe how the activation of this complex, the thyroid receptor in this case, like, the, like a dimer, could affect the immune cell recruitment, reduce inflammatory mediators, but promotes the and, and inhibits also cellular or uh, nuclear factors that affects cases like sepsis and cancer. But this is important. It affects the production of many uh, hormones and molecules that affects the degradation and production of fibrosis in the liver. So we have a lot of uh, epidemiological information to know why the activation of the thyroid hormone receptor affects a lot of the me liver metabolism. Um, this is almost the final uh, slides about the rationale for the understanding of 
thyroid and, and liver metabolism. And we can observe here why the receptor, when it's acting in the nucleus, like in the case of beta, beta form in the liver, and this affects very, very significantly hepatic proliferation and liver regeneration. And this has an important role for liver fibrosis and damage for other causes. And finally, we can observe how the, meta the cholesterol metabolism and lipase in the genes are very, very affected when the thyroid hormone receptor is activated and could affect positively the presence of NAFLD. With all the previous information, we will move to the epidemiological association. There is uh, at least three interesting meta-analyses in which the association between TSH and hypothyroidism uh, is, analyzed, is, is, is analyzed. And this is the most recent and maybe the most interesting. We can observe here in this forest plot that includes six trials, six studies, six, six epidemiological studies. And we can observe an increase of 25% of higher risk to develop non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in those patients with hypothyroidism. It's not so important, this association. I mean, talking about only an increase of 25% despite of the statistical significance in the clinical, it's not so important. It's important to know that there is a few inconsistency in this study. And this is uh, congruent with the levels of TSH and the risk for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We can observe an increase of 23%. And as I said previously, it's not so important. Maybe we have another more important risk factor for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but I think it's another piece for the puzzle that brings a very, a very view about this association. This is a very important study in which through the Mendel and the randomization using big databases, uh, this, the authors are able to uh, identify 10 single nucleotide, uh, nucleotide polymorphisms that are associated with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Despite of the Mendelendial randomization methods used in this meta-analysis, we observe how the risk is significantly higher, 75% around it. And this provides in, in, in genetic terms uh, uh, enough evidence to causality. Well, with all this information, the industry, the pharmacological industry, start to work about the therapeutic approach. We have two main ways to, to, to assess this problem. The first one is, to, is talking about only about a beta form of the THR, but also we have some metabolites. Uh, we have, in this case, four studies, one in patients with high, high, hypercholesterolemia, in patients with metabolic syndrome, those patients with congestive head, heart failure, and patients with low levels of thyroid hormones. And we can observe a consistent effect reduce, uh, reducing uh, LDL, triglycerides, in the body and in the lipids. But... This is a problem. There is an increase of uh, liver enzymes. Some cases, the adverse effects are not clear. And this is also very important that uh, there is an important increase in skeletal turnover and promoting fractures. So specifically talking about NAFLD, there is five trials until now. The first one is another selective beta agonist, ASTI3, uh, Sovetirom. This Sovetirom was stopped in phase one. This is maybe to, well, this is not maybe, it is because the security is not so, not so good. It's strange because as we can observe here, we have a lower weight in body and liver. We have lower serum levels and liver levels of triglycerides an increase in energy, energy expenditure and increase on in liver mitochondrial respiration. But it's paradoxical that there is a reduced insulin sensitivity in the liver. So for that reason and security issues, this trial was stopped. 
The second one that is another alternative in this moment is uh, Protyron. This is a liver specific THR agonist. We can observe in this scenario a reduction in the low density lipoproteins in plasmatic, uh, plasmatic levels of low density lipoproteins and increase in bile acid synthesis. This was stopped after phase three very similar scenario, we can observe a, redu a reduction in the insulin re sensitivity and safety issues. This trial, MBAO7011, is a prodrug. This is a very interesting prodrug for the liver with similar effects, increase in mitochondrial respiration, increase on receptors for LDL and reduction in APOC3. This was also stopped after phase two and it's not clear why. Uh, I will bring the, inform the, the attention for resmetrium. I will bring to, I will talk about TRC150094. This is analog to T2, to T2, sorry. And at the same, we can observe very well effects in the liver, in the body, and mainly to lipids, triglycerides, and mitochondrial respiration. This is a phase trial ongoing. And maybe the most interesting drug after this pipeline of drugs analyzed in the, in the past is resmetrium. This is a very specific uh, beta receptor with low extrahepatic penetration. I think this is the most attractive characteristic of this drug because the adverse, adverse events of these drugs are quite expected and very, very low. We observe the effects in animals, uh, lower levels in the liver of triglycerides, peroxidation, inflammation, and fibrosis this is interesting. And there is also in the liver a reduction in triglycerides in humans. Nowadays, uh, we, we will talk about the phase two trial. And nowadays, it's running the phase uh, three, a uh, very, uh, uh, very large multicenter randomized clinical trial. This is uh, the analysis of several compounds that are agonists or ligands or of a thyroid hormone receptor. We have the classic, the hormone T3, and we have another uh, ligands, ligand, sorry. And the, this one, MGL, is resmetirone. This is a study which, in which the, it's analyzed the potency of these ligands uh, through the gene expression, say, and we can observe that these two, the last one, BK2809 and resmetirone, in HUS7 cells has the most intense potency for the ligands, for the THA receptor. But in humans, in, hepat in human hepatocytes, we can observe the potency of resmetirone. I think this explains why in this moment resmetirone looks an, an attractive uh, therapeutic approach. We can observe how bigger is the difference comparing with T3. So I think we have the opportunity to observe in the future, I hope, uh, very interesting uh, results. This is the phase two trial. This is a very interesting study published in Lancet three years ago. And we can observe how dramatic is the reduction of fatty liver, of fat in the liver. We can observe here the, resonant, the magnetic resonance with 26% of content of fat in the liver, very, very clear, and how it reduced after 36 weeks. So uh, when we analyze the relative reduction and the absolute reduction of hepatic fat, it's, it's very, very important. So for that reason, resmetium goes to the phase two trials. This is a secondary analysis. This is a proxy. This is a, a long-term study. It is those patients that participates in the previous trials were offered an open, an open phase with resmetirum, and we can observe how resmetirum reduced two important aspects. The first one here in the right is the content of fat, and here in the left is the a proxy of liver fibrosis assessed by uh, magnetic resonance. And we can observe how when the patients receive resmetirum, both of them reduce significantly. And when the patients receive placebo, 
we can observe here how the patients receive placebo. So the reduction of fatty and fibrosis, of fatty of fat and fibrosis, it's not so important. But when the participants uh, start the open phase with resmetirum, there is an important reduction of fat and a proxy of liver, like liver fibrosis. And this is represented here by, reson by magnetic resonance, and we can observe the important changes in the open phase level. Uh, this is another trial that, uh, that assesses the quality of life in those patients that receive placebo. We can observe no differences in any of the aspects of the quality of life. But in those responders, this is important, in those responders to resmetirum, there is an important improvement in many aspects of quality of life, physical activity, body pain, general health, and the physical component summary. So we have enough information to believe that resmetirum is a good alternative to activate the thyroid hormone receptor in the liver and improve the liver metabolism and I hope reduce liver fibrosis in the future. I know this is a, this is a table, a very, 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 very horrible table, but it's very important because it brings some hypotheses. This is a network meta-analysis the importance of this network meta-analysis is that give a number of several drugs that are assessed for reduction of NASH and fibrosis and puts an order, and this is important because resmetirum is in the bottom. It's the number 12, number 15, and number eight, talking about activity to improve fibrosis, improve NASH, or improve two points of NAFLD activity score. So, with this information, maybe resmetirum is not the best alternative to be monotherapy. I think we think that uh, we think, and all the community knows that in the future, the management of patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is uh, a, comp uh, a, a composite of many drugs. We need to act in several pathways that are affected in patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And this uh, network meta-analysis brings the information about how we can select this kind of drugs. And this is a very interesting experiment in which uh, in animal models, we can observe how many uh, drugs were assessed. I am very interested in this trial because used resmetirum in two doses, the, not the, the, the pink one and the, and the, the brown. And in these experiments, we can observe that the addition of acetylcoxyl carboxylase inhibitors enhance the activity of resmetirum. We can observe the expression, the gene expression of many of genes related with liver fibrosis. And we can observe here in ACCI how the change with pink and brown are observed. So this is, uh, uh, proof concept, proof of concept about how the combination of many drugs are better than the monotherapy, and I think resmetirol will be in, in this scenario. And despite of only one phase two trial, there is a pharmacoeconomical analysis, and I think this is at the end of the day for any kind of drug that we are talking about for treating patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is, a, is the most important aspect. Why? Because as you can see, the theoretical cost of each day for this drug is about, is about $72. So, well, we need to think how to resolve this issue because obviously despite of the benefits because the reduction of the net benefit is very, very, very important. Despite of this, it's very difficult to any uh, health system uh, pay this kind of drugs or many drugs for treat, for treat these patients. Well, and with this, I will finish. This is, these are my conclusions. The first one is that there is a very important association between thyroid and liver and liver diseases in particular. 
I think thyroid receptor is a very attractive target for the treat of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease patients, but as in any other aspects of medicine, large trials with monotherapy or combination are needed to know if we have a best alternative to treat patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And with this, I finish my presentation and I appreciate all your attention. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, very, very nice presentation, very informative, and I think uh, raises a lot of uh, questions and doubts. I'm pretty sure that someone wants to interact with uh, starting with questions. Anyone? Uh, Natalia. Thank you, Norberto, for your presentation. As usual, it's very, it was very clear and very inspiring. My question is only related to the clinic uh, follow-up of these patients. So do you suggest that all patients with hypothyroidism should be enrolled for a screening of the liver, first of all? And the second one is that even if the patient presents hypothyroidism, if it is compensated, the risk for developing NAFLD is the same as those that are not compensated? Thank you. Yes, this is, this is a, thank you, thank you, Nata. And this is a, a very important question. Recently, we review a, a manuscript from, from a Chinese large group of patients, and they propose that in those patients with a normal, but high level, but normal high levels of uh, thyroid hormone stimulating could be treated with, with thyroid hormones. I think it's very difficult because the adverse events are important, but answering your question, yes, I think all patients with so clinical and overt hypothyroidism should be screened for, for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We don't have too much information about if these patients are in increased risk for liver fibrosis. This is a very important question. Maybe it, it, this is the most important aspect because, well, if we give the thyroid hormones, the patients are okay and there is no problem, but maybe those patients in the future are in higher risk for, for liver fibrosis. I think, I think this, is, this is very important. And if the risk reverses after the treatment, nobody knows in this moment. We expect that this occurs, but there is no information. In fact, in this moment, all the epidemiological information is related about the association between the thyroid status and presence of NAFLD. But this is a very important question and maybe we can assess in the future in, in, in the hospital, we have a lot of patients with fibro scan and we can assess if fibrosis is different in these groups. Thank you. I think this, this may be very important and very informative. Any other question? Well, let me... I have, I have one more, Prof. Go ahead. Roberto, is there any evidence about the sex differences in the incidence of NAFLD associated with hypo, hypothyroidism? I mean, are females <laughs> more sensitive than males to develop NAFLD? It's a good question. You, we know that females are more sensitive to develop thyroid uh, uh, diseases. This is well described, but we don't know if it's specifically the association with NAFLD is related with, with thyroid hormones. It's another good question. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Prof, sorry. Oh, no, no, I mean, is there any other question? Uh, if not, let me ask a question, which is a very, uh, let's say, philosophical one, if you like. But, I mean, what comes first? I mean, is the thyroid influence the liver or is the liver influence the thyroid? Because I think this is important to understand whether the treatment of a thyroid uh, uh, disarrangement, let's call it this way, or dysfunction is beneficial to the liver or the treatment of liver by increasing the exercise because it's the only approved uh, uh, treatment may help the reverse of the thyroid impairment. Is there any data on that? No, and in my opinion about that question is that it's only, we observe the association, but it's only a, a very small association, but was the cause to analyze how the beta receptor acts in the cells and someone says, wow, this could be a, a very good alternative for a pharma pharmacological uh, modification. But now I think there is, there is only a spurious epidemiological association, but with this was a very 
informative data to promote research and promote a, a, a pharmacological target. No, I agree, but I mean, let, let's make it a simple study. If you take people with NAFO, NAFO and you measure the thyroid status, and then you, you ask these people to follow a diet, and then you remove or improve the, uh, uh, the fatty content of the liver, actually you cure the, 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 the NAFO. Is the thyroid of this uh, 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 patients improving or not? Is anyone studied this? Not yet. And not yet. And that could be it. we're doing actually, because we can can see. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, what comes first, actually? Yes, I think maybe in the future we will be more permissive to treat uh, very small disturbances in in TSH, because nowadays there is no clear indication to treat patients with normal but high TSH right, levels exactly. with fatty liver. Being fatty liver, the risk factor to promote, treat early this kind of patients. I think this would be a, a good alternative. Okay, any other question? Uh, if not, thank you very, very much. It was a very nice, uh, uh, I mean, thank you, gracias. And gracias, we'll gracias. In touch. I mean, I, I know that we are uh, seeing each other in uh, 48 hours around the same screen. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you for your presentation, Norberto. Ciao, Norberto. Ciao, ciao. Okay. Gracias, Norberto. Ciao. Anche più. Se fue. Se fue, sí. Se fue, se fue. Se fue. Se fue. No se vio. La partido por primo. Chao. Chao a todos. Chao. Chao.